Hey guys, this is Raz. I want to give a quick apology for taking so long in this episode out. I actually got called out of town for a week or so doing a project down in uh, the Houston area. And uh, being gone without my recording equipment kind of got me behind the eight ball on this. So it's a long time coming, about a week and a half late. But this is a good interview with my buddy Luke Macias. And it's a longer one, so it gets you a little bit more for, uh, more for your, your money, I guess. Hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, don't forget, we really love some feedback either from you guys as far as you know, what we're doing right versus what we can do better, the types of folks you'd like to hear on the interview or recommendations from, uh, from you guys as far as people you would like to hear. As you can tell, I've got a lot of folks on here that I've been having that are longtime friends of mine and that are expert political operatives, but I don't want to just stick to my friend group. I want to be expanding and getting more folks on here that you guys want to hear from, and I'm happy to, uh, to go try to find some hard-to-reach people if you guys are interested in hearing them. Make sure you go like us on Facebook, follow us, and uh, subscribe on iTunes, and we'd love a, a good rating. Give us a good five stars if you have the opportunity. So you guys have fun, and I will be back with a new episode next week. This is the My Campaign Coach Podcast, where we talk about how to win elections. Every week, we let you hear straight from the best consultants, operatives, and candidates in the game, all for one reason, to help you win. For more information about how we can help you win, visit MyCampaignCoach.com. Now, here's your host, Raj Schaefer. Welcome to the How to Run for Office podcast from My Campaign Coach. Thank you to Campaign Sidekick for supporting this podcast. Visit campaignsidekick.vote to find out how their best in breed voter contact platform can revolutionize your campaign and help you win. This week's guest is my good friend Luke Macias, owner of the Texas based Macias Strategies. Macias Strategies is driven by the desire to achieve conservative policy outcomes at the state and local level. They believe that the policy outcomes of state and local governments often don't meet up with the social and fiscally conservative values that are held by the voters in those areas. Limited government will only be obtained through visionary, principled leadership, and those are the characteristics they look for when deciding what candidates and organizations to engage with. Luke has quickly become one of the most effective and youngest general consultants on the right in Texas. He's been involved in politics most of his life and actually started working for his father's state house campaigns very early on. His passion found root and the paid opportunities to manage and run campaigns came very, very quickly. And over the last six years, he's consulted on more successful campaigns than I can even count and a significant cadre of clients within the Texas Capitol and local governments are his across the state. Luke, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It is a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, you know, our relationship goes back a long way, and I want to start out by filling, out our, filling in our listeners a little bit more about your background. So start out by giving us a bit of your backstory, how you got involved in politics, and kind of your earlier road that led you up to being a GC. Um, no, and, and I know we do go back quite a ways for those who don't know Raz actually uh personally made the coffee table that's in my house so, <laughs> um you know on top of being involved in saving our great republic and defending the limited government principles uh anybody who knows Raz knows he's got some woodworking talents so he was uh you know good enough to to, to bless me and my family with that um it's a good wedding present it was it was it was it was it was a great wedding present so you know when I look at how I got involved, it was interesting because I grew up in a family that was pretty generally politically engaged. Um, but when I say engaged, I mean we stood at the life chain once a year and you know held signs that said "Pray for those who choose abortion" and um, you know watched every presidential debate. Uh, I remember watching every State of the Union, regardless of the president, growing up. Um, the first political comment or conversation that I ever recall really having that made me think about something was during uh, during the Bush Gore campaign. And I was listening to Rush Limbaugh in my mom's van. She was driving us to piano lessons and Rush was talking about the race. And I asked her, um, you know, mom, I'm trying to figure out who is it that we want to be president and I hadn't watched any of the debates. They hadn't really made their views super well known. I didn't know which candidate was even in which party at that point in time in my life. I think I was probably eight years old, I guess, at that point. No, 10. I was 10. Such and a she, said, um, she said, I think, um, I hope that we will get George Bush, um, but I'm afraid our country might deserve Al Gore. And um, it kind of put 
things in perspective and I started thinking about what that meant. But that's the first political conversation I remember having. And my dad's story is kind of a really long one that we don't need to get into. But um, there was a point in time early in his life that he really felt like the Lord had kind of impressed upon him that public service was something that he would be involved in later on. And uh, he had told my mom that, and that had been something that just was always on his heart. So when he retired from the Air Force, we moved back to the San Antonio area, uh, just got involved in our church. He worked for a local small business that my papa owned, an advertising agency, and we were just kind of involved. Um, we lobbied at the Capitol one day as uh, you know homeschool families for parental rights. And then a couple people came to him in late 2015 and asked him to consider running for state representative. And... You know, his mind, he was thinking he'd run for like the mayor of our small town at yeah. some point 10 years down the road. Uh, but instead, this opportunity came up. They prayed about it, kind of took it to us as, uh, you know, my six siblings. And we all agreed that it was something we should do. So we got into it. And he ended up winning by 45 votes of 20,000. And that was the state house, right? That was the state house in 2006. And so um, at that point in time is when I knew that my passion was in politics and, and really no other time before that. I mean, even growing up, I was not thinking I'm going to do all these grand things. Um, I was going to be a doctor because Luke in the Bible is a doctor. That's who I was named after. Um, <laughs> I love it. So that was my plan. And uh, I wrote, you know, papers on gastrointestinal tracts and vesticular organs and all sorts of other weird things, uh, even in middle school. And uh, mom would make me research stuff and all in preparation for me believing that at some point I was going to be a doctor, which is probably a really good thing I wasn't. And uh, so once I kind of had that as a passion, I, uh, I was doing college. I started working for a higher education company, which I worked for for five and a half years doing marketing, sales, product development. I was still in high school, so I was doing soccer and football and track. Um, and working in campaigns as well. So I interned with my dad in 2007, uh, worked on his reelection in 2008 when he lost. Um, he lost by 17 votes of 30,000 and was a really oh. contentious primary. Um, but that at that point, I, you know, I had kind of been bitten by the bug. I knew I was going to be involved. Yeah. So I, I worked a couple jobs, but not necessarily in politics. And I really just volunteered politically. Um, I drove up and spent two weeks in Arlington standing polls for Bill Zedler in his uh, election he lost in 2008. I uh, ran a local city council race in 2009 that I just kind of showed up. And you're probably used to this, but when you show up enough – and you've shown up more than anybody else, you start being given more responsibilities. And so yep. I started managing the volunteers and then I was helping rewrite our literature and then I was block, you know, creating a block walking strategy and then I wrote the mailer and uh, just kind of got engaged in 2009. And in 2010, I ended up running a campaign uh, for the State Board of Education, a re-election campaign of a gentleman who was getting uh, targeted by a lot of moderate establishment Republican people. And we were able to get him reelected. And so that kind of opened up the door. Um, and, and, and I was doing some things with different you know, websites. I was doing stuff throughout the grassroots. I was doing stuff just engaging both interested at a statewide level, but really more concentrated on my local area. I was the president of our local Republican club for a year, um, just kind of engaging and involving and volunteering hundreds, if not thousands of hours a year that were put in at that point. Um, I really focused a lot in the 2011 session uh, on what was going on in Texas. And I worked full time in product development um, for the higher education company. We had purchased a small business and I was kind of in charge of running that. And so I was running this small software company. Uh, and honestly, like every day I have the Texas House floor pulled up. I was watching every debate. I was watching committee hearings. I was following everything. And then I was engaging with some people in Austin uh, that were more educated on all the things that were going on, too. And, you know, that's what kind of opened it up for the possibility of me running campaigns, because what became painstakingly clear was there were a number of really, really, really bad legislators. And I knew a lot of them. They had served with my dad. But watching them and what they were doing and then realizing that there were several people out there that were considering running against them. But they didn't really have somebody they were talking to. They didn't really have somebody who, you know, was lined up and ready to help them um, and that there was a need for that. So several people around the state um, who at this point would probably rather remain unnamed, uh, <laughs> you know, just had mentioned it at times. Hey, is this something you've ever considered? And 
uh, we think it'd be helpful if you'd at least be willing to run a couple races. Because uh, at this time, there really were only a couple, maybe two or possibly three mm-hmm. general consultants that did conservative Republican campaigns. Because, you know, kind of a little bit of backstory on the on the Texas side. While a lot of folks think of us as this deep red conservative state, we have a pretty significant divide within the Republican Party when you get to Austin as far as Republican conservatives and very, very moderate ours. And so back in you know, 2010 and in the session 11, it became very clear that we'd reached this point of a supermajority, but we weren't governing like conservatives. And I think that's you know, probably something that people will experience in most states wherever they are, right? If they start oh, yeah. to look at their legislature. I mean, there are a handful of legislators, uh, legislatures, you know, plural, that have are doing a better job, right? Uh, but Texas isn't one of them, and it's something that would probably disappoint quite a few people the more they actually end up researching it. Yeah. Uh, but you realize that when we pass many of our reforms or laws or conservative uh, you know, legislation, that that actually came from being passed in other states at some point before us, right? And so you go, okay, wait, I thought Texas is leading. Well, no, Texas is, is really more of a follower when it comes to protecting your Second Amendment rights. And we're really more of a follower when it comes to protecting your religious liberty. And we're really more of a follower when it comes to government transparency. And we're really more of a follower when it comes to your private property rights. Okay, well, we'd rather lead. And so that happens from within. Uh, I basically just started talking to several people who were thinking about running and I didn't need to replace all that much income uh, to be able to survive. So once I had a couple clients, I uh, put in a month notice and help train my replacement with the higher education company I work for and um, and then transitioned out. And you know the way I looked at it was I knew that I was going to be engaged in, in politics. I had had, um, I had, had a, a political nonprofit talk to me about doing some statewide, gra- statewide grassroots coordinating for them. Um, I had talked to pro-life groups. I had you know been engaged. I had thought about running for county commissioner at a local level. I mean, I knew where my heart was and my passion was. And so to me, the 2012 cycle, which is really kind of the inaugural cycle of Messiah Strategies, was right. an opportunity uh, to help a movement get several more strong conservative voices that it was in desperate need of. And if that was successful and I could still keep the bills paid and keep the lights on, then that's where I would continue to serve. And if it wasn't, then I, I was pretty confident that other opportunities would open up. Well, and one of the one of the really nice things about the way that that played out was that not only did you have the fire and the desire to go help strong conservatives run in these primaries and win, but you were willing to take on a lot riskier races that no other consultant was willing to put you know their eyes on. And so that allowed you, in, in that first class of clients you got, not only did you have an incredible success rate, but you got some guys in there that are now in their third session kicking some butt down in Austin and holding true to their conservative principles. You know, the the entire political system incentivizes every single person involved in politics to behave poorly. Um, so, you know, if you're a lobbyist, in order to be successful, the system of lobbyists sets up certain unspoken rules that you can't break. And if you break them, everyone agrees to kick you out of the sandbox. And, um, and you it's know, true. the same rules apply to political consultants and the same rules apply to elected officials and the same rules apply to candidates. I mean, it's just the reality uh, that here's how you operate. Here are some rules and you need to not break these rules. And so at the end of the day, I mean, there are certain people that are in positions where even if they don't like a sitting chairman of the Texas House, or even if they really don't like a certain senior member who they think killed a lot of conservative legislation, they might not be able to even put their name on a campaign against that person, or they might have just decided for their business that that's not worth it. Um, And so, you know, it was nice that uh, my mom one time asked me about my business model, and I said, well, I charge everybody (laughs) less. And sometimes I'm the only person who will work for them. So, you know, if you don't have competition for half of your clients, it's not that hard. Uh, (laughs) That's something I hope changes. You know, I hope that in Texas we're able to continue to see more activists, um, more professionals show up, more consultants, more campaign uh, operatives, more candidates that show up. Uh, Because this is 
there is plenty of work to go around, uh, you know, no matter who you are and what your skill set is. Um, but it, it was it was the case in 2012, and uh, it is it is remained to be the case at least for some of the clients that I work for. Uh, that you know they're the type that probably wouldn't even have an, another option. Um, but yeah, so so 2012 ended up we were victorious enough. We defeated several incumbents. We won an open seat. Um, and we went to Austin with a handful of, of state representatives that we were able to work with. And this is my, the most fun I have is in the off years when we're actually able to work on legislation, which is, you know, the time we're in now, um, the time that we're actually able to try to do something, which we say we're going to do on the campaign trail. So the campaigns are a necessary evil. It's part of being a representative Republic. But if we could spend all of our time just simply in the halls of the Capitol fighting for the freedoms and the liberties that we hold dear and trying to expand those for the rest of our fellow Texans. And that would be ideal. Um, but campaigns are, are a necessary part of that. So that ends up being a, a large part of what we do. Well, it's a necessary evil, but it's become one that you're very, very good at. And in the years since, you know, that, that first inaugural cycle in 2012, when you had all these campaigns, you're, you're stable both of candidates and the, the electeds that you've helped get in there has, has grown to be a, to be a significant number and to be a pretty significant force in the capital. I think that's when it comes to affecting those policy outcomes that you talk about, they have definitely, they're definitely on their way and actively engaged in making sure that those policy outcomes are conservative and they have an impact here in Texas and really reverberating across the country, which is where it's, it's really cool to see us actually leading on some of these things. No, absolutely. And we have, we have real opportunities, you know, uh, sometimes Texas still seems like it's, it's playing catch up you know, with a lot of um, other states. But our hope is to catch up and then to pass them up at some point. Yeah, watch uh, out, guys. We're coming for you. We are blessed to have more oil than everybody else, which often gives us, you know, more economic success uh, than a lot of other states. Uh, but but in a lot of other policy areas, we're not necessarily um, we're not necessarily the, the tallest guy in the room. Yeah, that, that oil gives us a little bit of a buffer for some of the, the less – conservative policies we can we can survive a little bit more in some of those cases some gotta, of the waste fraud support. and abuse within the system yeah. definitely made made up um from the natural resources beneath our feet no doubt about that so let's go you know talking about some of those early lessons you obviously had a pretty pretty rapid trajectory from being you know getting involved with your dad's race in six and then you know only six years later you're running these you're running multiple campaigns as a general consultant what are some of those lessons that still stick out to you that you learned early on, especially the days when you're still a volunteer and kind of a conscript to some of these early races? I think, um, you know, early on, the questions I kept asking myself is what is it going to take to win? And um, I think many within the you know, seasoned political operatives and activists and everybody else probably overthink that element. Um, you know, there's a lot of battles that people don't engage with because they don't think they can win or they require somebody to have an exorbitant amount of money or the budgets that they put together are just, you know, they're, they're such that it's it's too high of a barrier to entry to even really impact change at a state level. And um, so a lot of times I've been trying to tear that down. But within the early involvement, whether it was, you know, some local activists saying, hey, we need to stop this school board run amok and me helping a, a local two local school board candidates get elected that were able to fire the superintendent or um a you know city council race that i was with and was not successful you know the whole campaign i kept trying to figure out what is it going to take to win so uh, i think a lot of times <clears throat> you know we just kind of take one step in front of the other and it's just like i need this endorsement and then i need this mailer and then i need this you know, set of signs. Now I have signs. Now where am I going to put the signs? Let's put up signs. And, you know, sitting down <laughs> and saying, wait, what is it going to take to win? What are our numbers? Right. How many actual votes do we need? Well, how do we get there? How do we even know if we're there? Um, and I think that at least helped put a perspective on how to efficiently target your energy. Because so much of the time you're trying to understand how to make the biggest impact. And whether you're an activist who has a couple hours a day, or whether you're a political consultant running a campaign or a candidate who's running for office, you know, you have so little time and you're saying, what will make the biggest impact? And often, first of all, the School of Hard Knocks is really helpful, right? And that's why when I talk to somebody who's going to run for office, if they're thinking about it a year or two out, one of the first things I'm telling them is, 
hey, there's a local guy down the street running for school board who seems like a good guy. You should go meet him. You should go knock your neighborhood for him. You should help him put up yard signs. You should do all – like I want you to get your hands dirty in this process to potentially understand what it's going to take. Sometimes <clears throat> there's examples of people who have already done all that. That's why they're now being called upon to run. Um, well, and so, and one, really, one really good example of that, we'll talk more about Connie Burton later, but yeah. Connie really exemplifies that. We had her on the Cobb podcast a few weeks ago, and yep. her trajectory of – Really, she wasn't interested or thinking about running for office a few years out. She was focused on, as a grassroots Tea Party leader, yep. going knocking those doors, helping with campaigns, doing the grunt work. And as she did that, the people around her would be like, man, you're awesome, and you'd make a heck of a state senator. Absolutely. And, and that's that was probably the one I was thinking about when I was talking about some who have already done it before. Um, yeah. And So some have been different activists, but oftentimes – there's, you know, there's a cadre of people out there who are very conservative minded individuals, you know, and they're the people that uh, when they hang out at dinner parties with their friends, they're the ones who are saying, no, government needs to get out of the way. And isn't it ridiculous that our city is looking at regulating all these businesses or Airbnb or Uber and they're complaining about the state of the country and they're saying, well, even Republicans won't really do what it is necessary. That person out there, but honestly, they're running their law firm or they're seeing their patients at their, you know, uh, medical practice or they're working hard in sales for a big, com you know, nationwide company and railroad tracks or pharmaceuticals or medical supplies. Um, that person then says, I want to run and I haven't been not involved. I just haven't known where to engage. And so studying and following is what helps you understand that, you know, and, and every session I go back to the legislative session, you feel like, oh, my gosh, now I know so much more of how to approach things. And every campaign is like that. You know, you finish a campaign and go, OK, I could have done this better. I could have done this better. Right. It happens less as time goes on. Uh, but the biggest thing is just always making sure you're observing instead of just working harder every time. You know, it's not just a matter of working harder because a lot of activists – I've seen them, you know, be there for eight to ten to twelve years later, and they're still doing the exact same things. You know, they're still fighting the losing bond battle, and they're still trying to stop legislation that keeps passing. And you know, every battle they seem to pick is the losing one. Um, and I feel like if you were able to just s take a step back and think about what lesson did I learn last time, and mm -hmm. how am I going to change my behavior this time, or change what I focus on, change what I spend my time doing. So. Um, I don't know if that even answers your question. I hope it does. <laughs> I think it does. What? And just to note, that doesn't mean not picking hard battles, right? No. That no. means that we are judicious and prudent about the battles we pick and that we make sure that when we lose, we inventory the reasons we lost and we find the ones that we can surmount the next time around. And even when we win, we do a detailed after action to make sure that because even when you win, there's going to be things you could have done better. Right, every campaign you won, from Connie's on down, there are lessons you learned along the way. And like I said, the more times you go through this process, the the more times you are able to to use that knowledge and and not have to get kicked in the butt by the same mistakes. But man, there's so much to learn every time, win or lose, and you got to hold on to that knowledge to help you do better the next time. Yeah, I mean, if if you lose, which happens a lot in politics, you know, you go back to the next battle and you go, okay, well. If I lose next time, I'd like to lose by less, and I'd like them to take longer to beat me. So um, <laughs> I, uh, when I was in high school, I had a buddy of mine that did Krav Maga, which is the Israeli form of martial arts, right? And he had done other stuff as well. And you know, he was four inches taller than me, and he was stronger than me. And So he was still short. <laughs> yes. He might have been more than four inches taller than me. <laughs> Luke he, is short, and I give him a lot of crap for that. Uh, uh, let's say he was he was six foot six one. I'm five five, <laughs> so it's much more than four inches. But here's the point: so we would, you know, he, and this guy just like he's a marine now, and so we would spar all the time. And you know, I every time we'd spar, he beat me. In fact. I can honestly say I sparred with this guy within a year and a half's time, you know, a hundred times, I feel like. I mean, it was it, we were over with each other all the time at his place or my place, and we just spar. And I lost every single time. But every time I'd say, okay, what did I do? And then how did this happen? And he would instruct me along the way. And so my definition of success was how long is it going to take him to beat me? 
And that's how I defined how well I was doing. I, I mean, I was not never winning. I would feel great. You know, I'd, I'd finish a battle and go, man, it took <laughs> two minutes to kick my butt. Sweet. I mean, that was like an accomplishment, right? And so I'm okay if the grassroots have the perspective, like we're going to get beat, but by golly, they're going to have to work their tails off to beat us. And that's okay. But the point is you want them to work their tails off regardless. These people are challenging the very foundations of what makes a free society. These people fundamentally do not believe that you have the rights that they don't have to parent your children, to defend yourself, to own your property. Right. And so that being said, yeah, bet your bottom dollar. If they're going to beat you, you want them to have to work tirelessly. In fact, hopefully after the battle, even if they do succeed in keeping you from expanding your property rights, maybe they'll say, I don't want to do this again. This was miserable. <laughs> yeah. and you know what? I'm going to say, look, if you're going to stop me from expanding my freedom, at least I'm going to make sure you're miserable doing it. And so I think there's um, a lot to be said for just understanding – how to be smart about how you approach it. And then if you don't sit back and say, okay, why did I lose that bond? Why did I lose that argument? Why did I, why did that bill pass? Why was I not able to convince that local official? Okay, let's, let's learn from that. And then we can kind of adjust moving forward. Well, and that process requires a, a lot of, uh, especially when you're working on it with a candidate that you've worked with, that you've worked with, that requires a great degree of transparency and oftentimes push you back because I've had more than a few, and I know you have as well, candidates that would be like, well, this didn't work out right or we didn't win or whatever. And like, this is why. And you look at it and you're like, no, that's not why. Yeah, yes. you, like we have to dig deeper. We have to be very like brutally honest with ourselves about that process. And it's often quite uncomfortable. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, whenever, if I, and I, several of my clients, this is probably just a good for anybody to know out there thinking about running for office. But, you know, several of my clients, I always point out that they didn't win until the second time they ran for office or the third. Yep. Um, and it's really worth taking note of. I mean, the fact that uh, they ran several times unsuccessfully before they got into office. And um, But the interesting thing is I can have two clients who I work with who run and are not successful. And then we can have conversations within, you know, 30, 60 90 days, six months, it just depending on how long it kind of takes them to process it internally and then us to sit down and have a conversation. And, uh, you know, there's really two big differences. There's either someone who says, okay, what did I not do as well as I could have done? Or there's somebody who comes to me and says, here are all the people that didn't do what they were supposed to do. And this is why I lost, right? Yeah. So you know, based on that first conversation, whether or not this person is likely to a run again and two, if they do run again, do any better yep. because sometimes they'll say I'm doing it again and I might not even want to work with them at that point. Mm -hmm. But that person is more than likely not going to actually make a difference. And so, you know, when, if, if we're not successful in a race, I'm not sitting down saying, what did that candidate not do? Right. I'm thinking, were there anything was there any way we spent money we shouldn't have spent money? Was there any message that would have been more effective? Was there any data that we didn't collect? Was there any? So, you know, trying to approach it from that perspective, and if the candidate is doing that, and the consultant is doing that, and the campaign manager is doing that, and the local activists who helped that campaign are doing that, saying, what could I have done better? Then, guess what? When they come back, they'll all be operating and performing at a higher level than they were last time. And that campaign's likelihood of succeeding is significantly increased. I'm a huge fan of that attitude because, and I frankly, I hate working with people that don't exhibit that from day one because that's the attitude that got me interested in politics. I've talked about it before in the podcast, but it was losing a race by 12 votes on a recount that got me hooked on politics, a state rep race when I was 12 years yep. old. And it was the fact, it's 10 years old. And so it was the fact that we lost by that narrow margin and that there was no way I could look in the mirror without knowing that I could have found 13 people to vote for Becky. Yeah. And that knowledge forced me to, that was like a day one lesson for me when it came yep. to, to those kind of that retrospective. And when you talk, touching on what you talked about, about the running multiple times, we interviewed Matt Krause, uh, the representative of <laughs> Kleine years and a mutual friend yep. for a long time. And he was the, he's the perfect example of that. He ran yep. once and got his clock cleaned, but ran in a really strong way, learned a lot, 
and immediately went to work diagnosing where they what their failure points were and put those lessons to work for him and he went away and and ran away with it the next time around no i think i matt uh kraus matt rinaldi um you know these people who ran uh, were not successful in Rinaldi's case. Uh, he, a client of mine, the state representative from the Irving Coppell area here in Texas, North Texas, great guy. Um, same situation, you know, ran for district judge, uh, in a County that really kind of leaned a little Democrat. And so, uh, they, the November election came around and the Democrat won that seat though. He did very well and ran for the legislature then in an open seat. Um, and then two years later ran again. And, you know, Matt's a perfect example of somebody who did not approach his third run for office in what are people going to give me this time around? You know, his approach was what can I do better and how do I prudently approach this in a way that increases my chances of being victorious? And what did I learn from the last time? OK, how can I spend my time different? You know, he the first time we sat down for that second run, he was saying, Here's what my schedule is like. How might we change that moving forward? Um, well, maybe we should spend less time doing this, more time doing this. And uh, he says, okay, yeah, you're right. Absolutely. So. so what are some of the personal attributes that you think have helped you specifically when it comes to being a GC? Because there are, you know, different people are fitted well to different jobs and roles, especially in campaigns. What are some things that you think have helped you specifically when it comes to taking on the GC role and making that jump? Well, if you talk to my clients, I don't know that they will um, ever testify that I am a good general consultant. So, um, it'd be until maybe, they look at the win rates, maybe. Well, even then, so I don't know. I think they would uh, be able to more quickly point to um, you know the, the the parts which I'm in continual need of reform and uh, and betterment. But I think at the end of the day, probably. Uh, a willingness to not sleep at all for long periods of time is probably one of the strongest attributes needed in anybody working a campaign. Um, <clears throat> Having a very gracious wife that lets you do a lot of hard work very. and uh, is, is very supportive has definitely got to be one of your greatest strengths that is, there. That is another one. And so that combination is is probably the, the crux of what leads to some success. But um, I, there's a couple things. So first of all, I think being picky with who you're willing to work with um, will keep you more passionate about what you're doing. Um, when you're, when you're picky about the people that you're trying to get into office, you will be much more passionate about helping them get into office. And Absolutely. so, and that's really true. If you think about it, whether you're a political organization out there trying to, you know, increase your standing, uh, within the political realm, if you're an activist who's trying to decide where do I spend my time? Um, you know, I might help a guy run for Congress, and he might even win. And then I might be miserable every time I look at the TV and see him voting some way that I thought he had told me he wasn't going to vote. And so if I'm pickier about who I really go put my blood, sweat, and tears into, first of all, the result isn't as important. Now, victory is what we're trying to do this for. So if we're not actually winning, and going back, I mean, we've won campaigns, right? And if we weren't put trying to put better Texas in a better place, and get more seats in the conservative hands, then yeah, you don't want to just go out there and waste your time. But that being said, I think when you're picky about where you apply your time, then you're much more passionate about how you employ your time. And, and it's a lot easier to stay up till two or three in the morning and actually work on multiple different clients uh, and what they're needing. Um, being able to try to understand every aspect of a campaign is incredibly important because it's so easy to kind of fall into real set of what you're comfortable in. And so, uh, I think a constant desire, you know, and this honestly is, is not credited to me. Um, the company that I worked for before is a company called Lumerit education. They were college plus at one point and Lumerit afterwards, but we had something, uh, we had a couple different characteristics that we talked about, uh, made up who we were, uh, should make up who we are as employees. And then we're also going to be trying to instill in the students that we served. And there were several of them, but one of them was being a lifelong learner. And, uh, I think you can attest to this as well, cause I know you pretty well. And, uh, the, the, the willingness to be a lifelong learner is what 
will actually give you significantly growing skill sets that you can apply to whatever you're trying to do. And a general consultant is just that. It's a general consultant. I mean, if you want to be a pollster, if you want to be doing ground game stuff, if you want to be a campaign manager, yes, you have to have multiple different talents, but you can hone in a specific skill set. You can concentrate on that. I could run, you know, robocalls for you, or I could be a statistician, or I could be a data guy, and I have to hone those skill sets in, but then I just have to continue to refine that same skill set. And the truth is, a general consultant actually has more to always be sharpening. You know, I mean, Absolutely. if I don't understand what their options are out there regarding the data for campaigns, then I'm behind the curve. If I'm really good at that, but I don't understand all the opportunities out there regarding digital advertising and media and targeting, then I'm behind the curve there. And then if I don't understand that the ground game is still absolutely important and the ability to implement and how to track that successfully and keep candidates accountable to doing hitting those same goals, you really have to be able to understand all potential aspects. And with campaigning and society growing and technology advancing at rapid rates, you have to stay on top of your different options. And so it's just very difficult. It was easy when I came in early because I was 22 years old or 21 when I filed my Messia Strategies LLC. And so um, it wasn't very hard to feel like I was ahead of the curve on technology and where things were going. Um, but as time has gone on, I found it you know, even more difficult to try to make sure that I'm always willing to look at the other options out there that are even outside of my current wheelhouse of operations. Now, one of the things you alluded to earlier, talking about going where your passion is and go, working for people you're passionate about. Uh, it's very clear for looking at your website, and I'm a huge fan of having a very clear mission statement and having very clear principles that you say up front. This is, this is who I deal with. These are the kind of things, because uh, one of the things that's made our friendship as strong as it is, is that yeah. we both come from a point of saying this is a passion. This is a place that you know, both as as political activists that we feel like these are the types of policies we want to put forward. And as Christians that we feel like this is a, a particular field that we've been given to toil in. And, yeah. and there's no doubt about it. Working in politics is a toiling effort. Absolutely. But through that, you make very clear on your website, the type of people you want to work with. Yes. And uh, I was like looking at people's websites because that's, that tells you a little bit about, you know, what the top couple bullet points they put value on it. I think it's important. And when you go to MessiahStrategies.com, you see you know, there are three things that you point out that set you apart. Um, you know, one is your motivation. So that's talking about you're, you're motivated by policy outcomes, not just political wins. And that's something a lot of people, especially candidates, honestly, lose sight of. Because for the candidate, like that first, you know, the first win is that you know, electoral victory. But that's not the ball game. It's We're talking about your long-term ability to affect political change. Because... The win is not where the payoff comes. On a personal level, yes. The second is that you're talking about you want to work with conservatives, people who are true conservative Republicans that are not afraid to challenge other Republicans, the non-conservative ones, and who are actively uh, practicing that cognitive dissonance. So they want to fight back against that cognitive dissonance with the moderate Republicans. And third, that you focus on, as far as these campaigns you run, you focus on getting a low cost per vote, which seems obvious, but is relatively rare. Looking at that bottom dollar is something that not all consultants do, but it's something that you've given a special account to because with a lot of these early campaigns you've ran and even current ones, it involves taking on people that don't have a ton of money, but they're folks that, that do want to have a strong impact on those policy outcomes. Talk a little bit more about how you make those three things mesh together. So, uh, the the first two I feel like kind of come together. So I'm going to talk about, you know, those, um, on the outset. And so, um, you know, what motivates us is, uh, we, we've got a cost for being conservative and then what, what is the end goal? Okay. So let me combine these two, the motivation and then the conservative principles, um, really do go hand in hand, right? Because you couldn't say, I'm really motivated by policy outcomes, therefore I want to help people that kind of vaguely understand what a conservative <laughs> right. principle is and have a general idea what the role of government is. So, you know, when we sit down with a client, before they're a client, before we've decided, is this something that our company is going to put our time, talent, and treasure towards, um, we want to know what is the role of government in your opinion, right? Uh, when does life begin? And, and should all human beings be protected? 
what are fundamental rights that are to be protected by the government um, and when can government uh, when can government take that right away or should it ever take that right away right um, and so those two things really go hand in hand where, where my deal is and the way I present it to anybody who's wanting to hire me or who I'm talking to is I'm motivated by policy outcomes so I could care less if you're a state representative I do care that this community is being represented by somebody who is not representing the conservative minded principles that it holds. And so you have those conservative minded principles and I would like to help you do that. Now, if I'm talking to somebody and he says, Hey, uh, can you help me run for state representative? You know, I think I really need to be governor. So in order to be there, I probably should run for state rep first. You know, that's probably somebody <laughs> I'm not real motivated to help. And that's happened multiple times. And those people I have not worked with. Um, because it was just clear to me that this guy and I weren't sharing the same motivations. I'm motivated by policy outcomes. If somebody says, I'm a really conservative Republican, and I'm really worried that we're not passing those bills, and I think we need more voices to get that stuff done. Okay, now you and I have not only the same motivation, if we talk long enough, I'll be able to figure out if you line with me conservatively. So it really comes this, it, it, it's really identifying first that they have the conservative principles, and that's done with an hour to two to three of conversation. And then afterwards saying, are we through that process? And afterwards saying, are you motivated by the same things I'm motivated by? And then if those two things connect, which in most cases they have, in some cases they haven't, in some cases I thought they did and they didn't. Um, but that all comes together. And then the point is, well, if we're going to run a campaign, we assume that since we're not since we are motivated by policy outcomes and we do hold conservative principles, we're not going to have more money than the other people, almost in every circumstance. Now, there's a couple exceptions that we've been involved in. So it's not like every single time we've run a campaign, we've um, been outspent. But every challenger, every challenge we've ever run against an incumbent, which we've defeated, which there have been numerous across the state of Texas, we've always been outspent. And in the open seats we've run, we've been outspent in almost every single situation. And so uh, still looking at those and saying, what can we do? How can we be efficient with contacting voters? Um, at the end of the day, our goal is to spend as little money per voter as possible. And why would that be? Okay, well, it's not to spend as little money and lose. But the point would be, if I can find a message that resonates with a voter more than my opponent's message, then it will take me less. And the same thing goes when, it's, when you're criticizing somebody uh, when you're talking about what you believe, you know, I, I really do have a theory that I don't know that can statistically be uh, tested, but it's much more expensive to convince a voter of a lie than it is the truth. And I'm really, I think there's a, a really a natural law aspect to that is my hope. Um, but if I'm running against an incumbent Republican who's going around saying, I've been fighting to protect your freedoms. Well, that's a lie. You have not been. Your votes don't say that. Your own bills that you author don't say that. Like, take away your votes. The bills you author would grow more government than they would take away. So clearly, freedoms are not expanding and government is growing. And so for that person, it's just like, well, you know what? If it were true, it'd probably be easier to convince people. But it's not. And so now I can take the things you have voted on and the bills you have filed and show them to people, and they're going to see a difference. And then they're going to realize that maybe you're not being completely honest. And Voters, in case anybody has gone out and talked to them recently, don't really trust what politicians say. And this goes for my clients as much as anybody else's clients, which means you better actually have real clear evidence of how you've done what you say you've done. Um, so from the incumbents that I work with, it's a real easy thing. When we say, I'm one of the most conservative representatives in the state of Texas, and people go, well, how, do you, how can you prove that? I don't know. Every single independent rating agency in Texas says I'm the most conservative or second or third or fourth or fifth. And so, and we're able to show them why. Here's what I voted on. And here's when I voted even against the majority of my own party to try to keep government smaller. And when you're running against somebody, that same is true. So some of that I think is just that you're willing to tell the truth more than try to mislead people about reality. I think that's cheaper to do. Um, but then also just focusing on making sure you're spending your dollars where you need to you're diversifying how you're contacting voters. Uh, they're getting the same message multiple times. You're being consistent in that message. And it's written in a way that actually um, 
is something they can relate to, you know, relates with the voters. Cause I think if you get, if you get too separated just from the normal Joe on the street, then you're not going to know how to write copy, whether it be in a, a direct mail piece or a television ad or a phone call that they're getting or how to tell your volunteers, how to talk to people at the doors that's really going to resonate with them. So, so we talked about a little bit about what you look for to a client. What does, you know, as a GC, what does your regular working relationship look like with these guys? It obviously varies from when you're in session to when they're not up for re-election. But generally speaking, if I'm your client and we're a few months out from a primary kind of working on it, what is, what are you doing for me? What are the services you provide? How do you help me as a candidate? So at that point, you know, if we're several months away from your election day, more than likely, unless it's a special situation, we've been working together for the last six months or so, right? So um, we had sat down as much as possible before that, ideally, or at least a couple months before that. Um, and we put together a budget of what it was going to take. We set expectations for what your time would be. So we said, you're going to have to knock on this many doors. You're going to have to talk to this many voters. You're going to have to raise this much money, which means you're going to have to probably ask around this many people for money. Uh, you're going to be going to these events. You're going to be posting on Facebook. You're going to be responding to voters. We're going to email people. You're going to have to email them back. You're going to go talk to them at their door. Then they're going to say they want a yard sign. Then you're going to have to go put the yard sign. So we've kind of talked through all the potential requirements of what you've committed to do. Yeah, you've got a fully built plan that you guys work together in very heavy detail early on. You, you got your battle plan, order to battle laid out. And we try to set those it. expectations as much as possible. And, uh, but the truth is that campaigns are changing constantly, you know, so you, you set the expectations to the extent that you can um, establish a budget, a timeline, and then say, OK, now we're executing. Now, if we're three months away from an election, it means we've been already working regularly. Right. We've been talking every week. We know how many doors you've knocked on. We know how much money we have in the bank. We know where we are in regards to our budget. We're probably at that point, maybe even evaluating whether we're going to execute the plan that we originally set out or if we're changing it. You know, I mean, the truth is 90 days out, a lot starts happening. So at that point, you're saying, OK, do I need more money? Do I even have enough money? Yeah, am I even on a path to be able to fundraise what we even set out to fundraise? And if we can't, what does that mean? Does that mean we have to cut certain things? If so, what do we cut or do we have to raise more? Is that even a possibility? And if so how do you need to apply yourself to potentially raise more money? And so. We're trying to kind of evaluate that those last 60 days is that storm. The goal is to make sure that we are both on board with what's going to happen so that you as a candidate in those last 60 days, when your opponent is attacking you, when people are talking, when the signs are going up, when the pressure is happening, your friends are calling, they're worried that yard signs of your opponent are going up in their neighborhood and they don't see your yard signs and you need to come into their neighborhood and get more yard signs and you're going to have all these distractions that come up. And at that moment in time, are you focused on what it takes to get to the finish line? Because there isn't a whole lot of room for error in many of these situations. And your miscalculations or my miscalculations will potentially position us poorly to be able to be in a position to uh, then get across the finish line before our opponent does. And so uh, the goal is setting those expectations correctly, but then we're also making the actual implementation. So you don't know who you're supposed to mail. We do. We know how many voters. You don't know who you're supposed to knock on. So those things have already been put in place. You know who you're knocking on. We've given you that data. You're, you're making that happen. We know who, how many households we're going to mail. We're creating plans around that. Uh, we're designing those mail pieces. We're writing the content for that. We're making sure that our emails are going out. If somebody within your team can't do that, somebody on my team is helping you write emails and helping send those out. We're getting volunteers ready. It, many of our races are handled differently. So we try to set up kind of some general parameters that we want to operate in. But the truth is the different campaigns end up needing different things. Um, you know, one campaign will say, uh, you know, the candidate is just not knocking enough doors. Let's say if that's the problem. And in that situation, you know, I might send somebody from my staff or I might just go up for a day or two and drive around that guy's district and knock on doors with him and make sure that he understands the value and what he needs to be spending his time doing. There might be a candidate that is just off to the races on that area, but they're not fundraising. And so we're saying, OK, this is your weakness. 
we need to help you do this. We need to send emails for fundraisers. We need to be raising more money on Facebook. We need you to sit down and make these calls. In order to make that happen, you and I might need to get on the phone and you make calls while I'm there on the phone. Um, or if not, how else are we going to do this? Do you need to go one-on-one -on -one and meet with these people? If so, that takes a lot longer, but you need to do it in order to get this support. And so being really honest with the candidate and trying to understand where where are they enjoying what they're doing, where are they not, right? Most candidates will spend time doing what they enjoy doing. So if I really like block walking, that's what I'm going to do, but I'm not going to call anybody and ask them for money. I might really like fundraising, but I hate block walking, which means our conversation 90 days out is going to be a different conversation than with the other candidates. So it's really making sure that every section of our voter contact plan is actually able to be implemented. And if it's not, being honest with you about, look, this is your campaign. This is your name on the ballot. This is your job you put on hold. This is, and sometimes, in some cases, your own money that you've put into the campaign. So if you don't want to block walk, that's your decision. But let me be honest with you in saying that that now means you have to do all of these other things that weren't even in the original plan. So are you going to raise more money than you thought you were going to raise? Where are you going to raise that money? Do you want to try to put more of a plan together on that level? And I can tell you, here's what I think you should do. You might say, well, I'm not going to do that. Well, then here's what you need to do in order to make up for not doing what you should do. Um, and then the other part is just making sure that, you know, there's somebody, look, this is a stressful situation. I mean, you're out there putting your blood, sweat and tears into this deal. And this is somebody who knew the plan going in, who knew why you were doing this, what your motivation was, and to just try to help keep you focused on that while at the same time saying, what are the things that you're most worried about in your campaign right now. Okay, how can we help take that burden off of you so that you can focus on doing what you do best? Talking to voters, convincing them of your message, earning their support, and then going on to the next person. What are some of those, I mean, you mentioned fundraising and block walking, which you and I both agree are two of the biggest indicators. Those are two of the mm -hmm. primary things candidates spend their time on. When yep. you're analyzing a campaign, whether it's looking, you're coming in to help triage situation, or looking from the outside, what are some of the top attributes that you look for to tell you whether a campaign is healthy and on the right rails or whether it's coming off and headed in a bad direction? Well, there's a lot of in between, right? So there's a lot of there's a lot of in between healthy and coming off the rails. Usually if something comes off the rails, it takes a little while to get there, right? right. As I think with anything in life, you know, whether it's uh, your marriage, uh, an organization's health, a campaign, mm -hmm. a church, a business, right? I mean, those the, the coming off the rails can be avoided multiple times along the way. There's multiple, multiple forks in the road. And so it's really, in, in the long run, um, there's a couple things. So you might have a candidate that ends up being very healthy as a candidate. They knock a ton of doors. They're able to be convincing. They're able to spend their time well, um, but they might, have a much weaker local base. You know, how many, how many volunteers do you have? How many people do you have really coming around you? Uh, I would say it, it's kind of a, a couple things. So we want to make sure that you as a candidate are increasing your voter contact, you know, every single week leading up to an election. We want to make sure that you are talking to more and more and more and more voters. Um, and that you enjoy doing it and that you're actually converting them. Um, you know, we actually look at the conversion rate uh, of when it, how many conversations does a candidate have if they're knocking on a door, which you can use with Campaign Psychic, and how many are they actually getting to convince them to say, yes, I will vote for you, right? So I might look at one candidate and he's knocked on a thousand doors and he's had 400 conversations and 300 of those people said, I will vote for you. And there's another candidate who's knocked on 1,500 doors and he's talked to 700 people. He has a really good neighborhood that's all opening the door, but he only got 150 of them to say they'd vote for him. So we're trying to notice all those things along the way. Hopefully three months out from your election, you're either you've either identified and we've identified and fixed those problems, or you've just ignored us. <laughs> like it sometimes if, happens. If we're 90 days out. We probably should change. I shouldn't be stuck to the 90 day scenario, but, uh, but, but that's just the truth. You know, we're, we're, uh, so health, health is going to have to do with, are you contacting voters regularly? Um, is your campaign not wasting money? A lot of campaigns are spending money on all sorts of things. Are you being prudent? I mean, patient 
executing. Um, are you fully aware of where we're going as a campaign? Um, in, do you have your expectations set correctly? Um, when I start talking to clients and they go, you know, I, I don't think he's going to attack me. You know, I don't think my opponent's doing anything. I don't think, you know, I don't even think he's taking us seriously. All of these things you go, okay, this is a problem. I'm worried about your mindset, right? Yep. Because you are way too comfortable. You are feeling way too good about this. And that's a problem because comfort creates relaxation, creates complacency, creates potential destruction. You know, and so uh, where are you at when it comes to is your head in the game, right? Are you concentrating on what's for you? And are you aware that at any moment your campaign could get pretty darn serious? Secondarily, are you contacting voters? Are you converting those voters that you're contacting? Do you have at least a group of core volunteers? I don't care whether it's eight people or 30 people, but a core group of people that are really dedicated to this on top of you, because that means that there's other people invested in this throughout the community that are trying to get out there and do the same things. And do you have enough money in the bank to be able to at least contact voters at a frequency that will at least have your name ID up to where you're going to be competitive you know, on election day? So a lot of the folks that are listening right now, they're they're either thinking about run for office at some point or a current candidate or looking to help out on the staff side or, or even some volunteers. Yep. But talk specifically about those folks that are interested or, or should be interested in running for political office. What are some of the top things that they can be doing today uh, in the out of cycle year to help prepare for that run, whether it's next year or beyond? <clears throat> so the first one would be, I mean, if you're looking at running in 2018, you know, you really need to have your mindset ready to to pull the trigger on if you're in a primary to be pulling the trigger on that, you know, this summer or this mm -hmm. early fall. Right. So you, you're coming up on on a little bit of time. Um, so that's probably a little different situation where you really do need to be having serious conversations with people in the community saying, hey, I'm thinking about running for office. Would you be willing to help me? Right. Calling people that, you know, whether they be business owners or educators or people involved in church or pastors or you know, saying, Hey, what if I were to do this? What would you think about? And then researching, you should know, you know, if you're going to run for, when I thought about running for County commissioner, you know, I went down, I had every single pamphlet of County materials and what our budget was and what we spent money on. And I was, you know, boning up on all the information that I needed to know in order to uh, be able to go out and articulate what I believe, right? And a lot of people go, I'm really conservative. I'm pro-life. I don't like spending. Okay, what do you want to do as a state representative? I don't know. <laughs> I want to be against spending and protect unborn babies and expand your freedom to carry your firearm. Okay, well, that's good. It's a good start, but you know, there's a lot of other policies that go into that. So searching out and reading through and studying up on information um, and then getting a group around you because if you're not – you don't want to jump into this alone. So the reason you're talking to everybody is that you want 25, 30, 40, 50 people that you can hold accountable to saying, you told me you'd help me if you did this. I need your help. This has to be a group effort in order to really get us on the finish line. A lot of people start thinking about running you know, even further out, right? There's probably going to be people who are considering running at some point in their life. And I think the important thing is you know, first of all to have a servant's heart. Um, about all that you're doing. You know, if you're in your church, you should be looking at where you can serve. If you are um, in the Rotary Club or in your Chamber of Commerce, you should be looking at where you can serve. Um, if you are involved in your kids, you know, be the coach of your kid's soccer team. Why? Because it's service. It's truly service, by the way. I mean, I've coached kids soccer um, and not my kids, actually. And uh, that's even more service. But uh, it's a blast, but you're really taking your own time, time you could be spending doing a whole lot of other things, and you're serving. And you know what? We are looking for public servants. So uh, if you're not out there and you're not serving, whether it's in your realtor group or your medical group or your chamber of commerce or your church or your uh, you know community that you're with, then you're not going to be somebody who's invested. Uh, so I know we're running out of time here a little bit, but you mentioned – you know, Connie Burton as, uh, as somebody who I know has been on this podcast and, um, and who you've worked with in the past and I've worked with and all of us have supported. And, you know, that's a good, she is a really good example of that as somebody who, um, <clears throat> wasn't even seeking to run for public office. You know, interestingly enough, it's like, if you want to run for public office in two to four to six to eight years, you should do what Connie Burton did for a number of years. But 
she wasn't even looking and actually ready for office. <laughs> so yeah. somebody who said, where can I serve? I mean, I want to make a difference. It, you know, it always kind of does disappoint me when somebody shows up and says, I want to run for office. Okay. And I've been working hard. I've been doing these things. I've got $150,000 of my own money to put in the race. Great. What conservative people have you donated to over the years? I've never done that. Okay. And there's just a little bit of disappointment. Those people can still make wonderful public servants. But you have to ask yourself, why is that money sitting in your account? You haven't been out there and you haven't thought at one point, hey, maybe there's this other guy like Ted Cruz who is really fighting the hard fight. And maybe I should help him since he's doing what I would do if I was up there. So that servant's mentality that where can I get involved? How can I help? And by the way, yes, politically too. So I, I, I kind of was remiss to not mention political organizations too. But the reality is if you want to run for office, well, you'd rather not show up to places and the first time you meet these people say, I'm, run, I'm running to be a leader in this community. You know, you'd rather have been there before. So show up to your grassroots organization, show up to the Republican clubs, know your local officials, take them out to coffee. If you email your local city councilman, unless you're in New York City or something, I bet you, you can get a meeting with him in his office. I bet you, you can even get him, grab him a cup of coffee and understand what he does and ask him some questions and tell him you want to serve and you're looking to get more involved. Um, do some research because that guy might not be that great of a council member. If he's on city council, more than likely, he's not that great of a council member since that the vast majority of city councilmen are not good council members. But uh, <laughs> But reach out to these people and, and have some conversations, educate yourself, engage, show up to a Republican group, and then serve. Go Instead of going to church and criticizing what you don't like about it, try to serve. Uh, you know, these are good principles uh, across the board, but those are the people that they look for. You know, my dad was approached by people in our church about running for state representative. And think about that. He did not in any way pursue it. He wasn't even trying to do things to position himself. He'd never gone to a Republic, Republican club. He'd never been involved in the party. He'd never gone to a political event locally. He was approached by people within our church who said, we are looking for someone. We're more engaged. And when we're looking, we thought you would be a good candidate. Why is that? Well, my dad has a bit of a servant's heart and he's somebody who is willing to do Whatever needs to be done to help people, whether it's in the church or moving them or serving or preaching or leading music or anything else. And so he's somebody who will stand out as somebody who's willing to serve and somebody who cares about the things that he's investing in. And that stands out to people. So um, those are some little principles, but the, the really nitty gritties are, you know, get out, expand your network, meet more people. But when you meet them, do something, serve, because that's what's going to stand right. out to them. So yeah, network, meet a bunch of people, never never eat lunch alone, go to the chamber mixers, go to the Republican club meetings, do those things, but you'd rather not just show up and be, you know, uh, 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 candy on the wall or whatever, you know, some decoration. You'd rather actually try to do something, so. So I got, I know we're running a little bit long and I appreciate your time, but we got, I got two more questions I want to throw you away. So you've been involved, especially with all these campaigns and helping either make hiring decisions or help bring people to your candidates to, to staff their campaigns and even their legislative offices. And that's a, a something that doesn't get as much of attention as it deserves in a lot of, a lot of campaigns. It's the, because personnel is policy yeah, and that really helps set up a lot of whether you're going to be a long-term winner or whether you're going to be the wallflower. What are some of the things that you look for in those staff and how do you help those, those candidates and, and elected officials find the right people to fill those offices and serve those people? Um, it's a good question. I, uh, I have kind of a conversation I have with a lot of campaign managers when we're looking at hiring them. And I like to tell quite a few of them that, um, you know, I've hired a lot of campaign managers and I've fired a lot of campaign managers yep. and, and, and I have a really easy formula by which you will never be fired as a campaign manager. And it's, do what you say you're going to do. And if you mess up, own it, and then don't make that mistake again. And it's really simple. And, and that sounds weird. Like I'm not trying to be all self-help uh, in this situation. But <clears throat> so when you're a campaign manager at the end of the day, you know, you are there to alleviate the burden of the candidate, right? 
And so in that situation, the interesting thing is every single candidate needs something different. So one candidate might have really good strengths organizationally, and he can he can keep his budget together and he can know how many volunteers are going in. He can do all these things where what he needs you know, help with is kind of the motivation to kick his tail and say, you haven't done this, you haven't done this, you haven't done this, you haven't done this, right? But his organization is great. Other people, I mean, they're going out and they're blowing and going. Like you don't need to motivate them at all to even go out, to talk to voters, to raise money, to do anything. But the organization behind them is just horrible. So you've got to then fill that void in. Some of them might be good organizationally, might be great when it comes to contacting voters, but they don't like working with people. They don't like managing volunteers. They don't like talking to the activist who's calling them the 20th time to tell them that they need more yard signs in their yard. So you then have to fill that void and be that people person. And the truth is, you might not even know at the start of the campaign, and I might not know what that is that you're going to need to do. So you're going to have to have a mindset that says, here's what I need to do, and here's what I'll do it. I have never had a candidate call me and tell me, I have a problem with this campaign manager. I need a new campaign manager. If that campaign manager simply did what they were told to do. And what I mean by that is not, you know, this isn't a drill sergeant who's, you know, keeping you busy 80 hours a week and you can never sleep. This is just like, hey, I need all these volunteers called this week. Just make sure to call the volunteers that week. Now, that's like a five hour job of your 40 hour week. So guess what? You have a lot of other freedom. As long as you do those few things that each candidate and or consultant are really concentrated on making sure you reach your deliverables, you're going to be seen as somebody who can be counted on, who can be uh, trusted. The other deal is just being willing to do absolutely anything. The most, um, I won't name her, but she's definitely the most talented campaign manager I've ever worked with. Um, And, you know, what I love about her is that even when she was managing multiple different people, and managing a lot of different details um, and juggling the scheduling and the volunteer coordinating and the candidate's time, she would still go out and just knock on 20 doors and you know do her part to go out and talk to some voters or just go to the polls and sit there and talk to people and win their votes because um, she knew that she was part of the nitty gritty part of the team as well as all the other aspects that are higher up. And so just having that mentality of being able to do anything and everything. Um, And then not over romanticizing the job. You know, I run into this more so than anything else that you have all these people who have watched, you know, one or two campaign, uh, you know, movies, uh, the Ides of March or whichever that one, that one was. (laughs) And uh, there's total reality. Yeah, House of Cards, and then they've watched a couple other TV shows. There's like a Hulu TV show that's about campaigns. If you haven't watched it, you should. It's just kind of weird. It's yeah, kind of, I've seen it. It's kind of like The Office. Yeah, it was entertaining. Um, but like they've watched a couple of those at the time, and then they've you know, they had this over romanticized version that they're you know as a campaign manager of a state representative campaign going to be involved in, um, you know, looking at polling data and assessing where they should be spending their time and doing focus groups and then, you know, rewriting every word and picking the candidate's tie because they know the color that people trust the most. And, you know, I mean, The Good Wife and House of Cards and Ides of March is probably not anywhere close to an equal (laughs) representation of what it will take. So being able to just take that down to reality and say, I don't care if any of those expectations are met. I'm here to win a campaign. What is it going to take to win a campaign? Um, is going to be really helpful. So taking out that romanticized version of, of what it is they're getting into. So last question, if you were to go back to yourself a couple years ago when you're starting all this stuff, what are some of the pieces of advice or one major piece of advice you kind of gave yourself to, if you had to go do it all over again? Um, there's probably a couple. Um, one would be uh, continue to, to create more systems before you need them. Um, you know, I, uh, because we had several victories as the campaign seasons went on, all of a sudden was managing significantly more and I didn't set up the systems. I think this is probably something I've learned from you and several other people who I think do this a lot better than I do. But when you're starting something, even when it's in its infancy stage, 
still creating the systems that will be successful as it grows. And that's not something I did. You know, I kind of tried to set out to sail and then continue to build my boat, you know, while we were in the middle of a lake. Um, and the Lord is very gracious and compassionate and uh, can, can be patient with us even when we get ahead of ourselves. And so there's a lot of grace in that. But being able to just set those systems out, it's just a pure business um, thing that I think I learned early on and um, or I, I learned late on, but I'm glad I learned early <laughs> enough to begin to implement over the last couple of years and, and have a, a, a more organized uh, set of systems that we're able to implement. Um, take time to really hire people, you know, take time uh, to really understand your employees and the people you're working with when you, when you uh, build a business and you start uh, hiring people and bring them on and building a team. You want to make them successful. You want to find out what they care about. You want to find out what they're searching for and what they need to feel fulfilled, whether it's in what they're doing for you or what they could do for other people. Um, I think the HR side of building a team, and it's really the same thing even in politics. You know, if, if you are the leader of a group of people trying to defeat a local bond, it's the same needs. If you are a you know, a candidate running for office trying to figure out how to move legislation through a process of 149 other politicians, that's something you need to be able to have some insight into. So um, that's something I would definitely look back and uh, and say. Um, I would also say to not put too much faith in people. Uh, and, you know, you have to, um, you and I have talked about this too, but in politics in general, you know, I have a small cadre of people that I just know will be with me and there and in the fight and can be counted on thick or thin, uh, no matter what happens. You know, they'll have my back. And I've realized in politics, even people that I love and care about and agree with and fight with are not always people that I can necessarily just sit there and, and implicitly trust will always be there. And, um, and that's how you get burned out in politics, you know, yep. when it when some is. person that you had faith in fails you, um, it's, it's why your faith shouldn't have been there to begin with. You know, yep. your faith in your faith in your your Lord and Savior uh, who has granted you not only life on this earth, but life eternal through his son. Uh, but then also, uh, you know, you do need a band of brothers. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm no doubt. I made my wife uh, go through a lot of that. Nice. show. Um, we're still awesome. working on it. Um, but, uh, but you know, you need that band, but that band is, is, is a small band and there are a lot of other people you're going to work with. And there's a lot of people you're going to be close to. And there's a lot of people that you're going to fight different battles with, but those are not necessarily people you would sit there and say, you would literally die in a foxhole with me for the cause of liberty and freedom. That that's a pretty small group. Have that small group, have faith in those people. Understand that even those people might fail, um, you know, and any marriage uh, premarital counselor or seminar would probably say the same thing about your spouse. So it doesn't change a whole lot. But that, that's another thing I would say that different points in time in which I just found myself really depleted and upset and let down were times that I looked back and realized I just placed my faith wrongly in certain people that I should have known from the outset, not bad people, uh, in fact, better than me oftentimes, but that I shouldn't have had faith in that, 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 that would just always be there no matter what. Well, Luke, I appreciate being on today. We're going to have your content information in the show notes. You can find awesome. Luke on Twitter as effectual change. Luke Macias on Facebook and Macias com is the website. You can get a hold of him and his guys and find out if there's ways you, you can be helped by his, uh, his campaign strategy. Definitely some way it's uh, part of my band of brothers and somebody I trust quite a bit. Luke, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I want to also thank our sponsor, Campaign Sidekick. And be sure to check out the show notes. We've got all the details as far as some of the, the time stamps for different topics from today, his content information, and would appreciate y'all rating us on iTunes and giving us some love on Facebook. So thank you guys very much. Thanks again, Luke. And we'll talk to you guys again next week. Thanks for asking. Please subscribe and rate us on iTunes to help spread the word. We'll be back with you next week with more campaign insights from My Campaign Coach.